Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever in the world you are connecting from today. Happy, what day is it today? Is it Wednesday? Happy Wednesday, everybody. Wednesday, May the 3rd. Uh, if you're watching this live, thank you so much for being here in any of our social media channels, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Please let us know where you are connecting from. It would be awesome to know where everybody's connecting from. So just post it in the chat. Let us know where that is. If you have any questions or comments or ideas or anything else that you want to share during this conversation, please feel free to also post it in the chat. I am, if you're live, I am reading you. I am looking at the comments that you are posting on that chat. If you are watching this, uh, recorded on our website. Well, thank you so much for being here. We're recording this on May the 3rd. And as you can tell, those of you who are live or uh, watching the replays, we this year we've had an incredible uh, number of conversations with brilliant, talented authors who are coming to this Hacking HR live chat series to talk about the research that they've done to write their books and their books. So it's been a very exciting journey to be able to have them all in these conversations. I am hoping that if you are live right now, or if you are watching the replays, you can go to the rest of these conversations that we've had. They are truly amazing. So you can just go to hackinghr.io and click on live chats, and you will find all of the previous conversations that we've had this year in that link. So lots of good stuff. We have many more conversations lined up for the rest of this first half of the year. So many, many awesome authors are coming to our live chat series to be sharing with us. And we have um, a great lineup, a great agenda for the next uh, couple of months. So I'm hoping that once again, you continue to join us and you continue to stay engaged with your own learning, because that's ultimately why this matters so much. It is for all of us to grow together and, and learn more. So today we're going to be talking about coaching presence, understanding the power of the nonverbal relationships. Super excited about the, this conversation, and I'm going to be welcome, welcoming Tunde to the screen right now. Uh, hello, Tunde, how are you? Thank you. Thank you for being here, Enrique, with me and having invited me to this today. I am so excited to be here. Uh, I'm based in Austria, so this is afternoon here. I'm looking at a huge tree just in front of me, and uh, the rest is the forest. And uh, this is actually how I chose to be here to, because it feels like when I have this open space, I can be more closer to the, to the audience, mm -hmm. to those who are listening to us, rather than sitting in a corner somewhere. And that's how I wanted to be present, at least in 2D, to uh, to connect with everyone. So yeah, well, I, I think we both share the 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 love for nature. I I am also um, privileged enough to be in a place that is pretty much forest. I live in a small town in a very forested area, and my window, you know, when I open the actual blinds of the window, it all looks back to this incredible forest, the, actually the largest Ponderosa pine forest in the world, mm -hmm. uh, right behind my house. So, I, uh, you know, you know, so good fortune to, to be here. Tunde, please let us know, uh, for me and for the audience, let us know more about you, who you are, the work you've done, and why why you wrote a book on coaching presence? Mm. Well, who am I? That's a very big question, who I am, Enrique. Uh, <laughs> I don't even know if I can answer that question. <laughs> uh, if I'm honest, from a point of view of presence, uh, especially. Um, I think I'm somebody that is becoming, <laughs> constantly mm. becoming. And... Um, I mean, physically speaking, I am based in Austria, in the Viennese woods. <laughs> and um, emotionally, who I am right now, maybe let's just to stay present with, with us, with everyone here, is emotionally, I am very joyful. So I'm somebody that um, is running constantly around with a big smile on her face. <laughs> and, and people wonder, Tunda, where do you have your energy from? <laughs> And I don't know. It's 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 a very complex question. 
cognitively, I am somebody that just loves learning. Mm. Uh, I love constant learning, constant development. And maybe that will tie in with your question about like why write a book about coaching presence. Because I'm also somebody that's not just in her head, mm. but also somebody who practices a lot. Like I am an executive coach and I practice, uh, I have been practicing for 15 plus years. And it's through a very special experiential learning moment, actually a very painful one, that um, this idea of writing a book eventually um, came about. I, I didn't have the, the idea to write a book. I didn't want to actually, <laughs> because everybody wants to write a book. And I said, I don't want to write a book. When people zig, zig I want to zag. So just leave me alone. What can I write about? <laughs> Everybody's writing about something. So it came, it was pure serendipity because I connected with this very painful moment in my career with a client of mine. And then I started researching the topic of presence, which I found was totally uninvestigated. Un mm -hmm. Everybody seemed to be having an idea of what it could be, what it should be. So there were wild, wild ideas around and abstract concepts around what it is for everyone. Um, and even in our uh, ICF, in, in the International Coaching Federation field, so while we are defining it in a certain way, we don't have behaviors that that would that would you know show what it really is and how to work with it. And I I came to realize this in in my experiential moment with a client when she said to me, and I was way into into my into my career. I was ICF MCC coach. I had my masters in executive coaching. I I was like really very advanced in my career, and I thought. I thought I knew who I was, right? Mm. To, to come back to your question, who are you? I don't, don't know. <laughs> when, when, this, when this beautiful soul in front of me just said at a moment, Tunde, why is your body going backwards when you're saying yes? Mm. So she picked up some incongruence between this language that was forward moving mm. and then the body that was backward moving which happened totally unconsciously. And then she said, you know what? I, I don't think this coaching thing works for me. Hmm. I was about to opt out of the coaching relationship. And then I, and I said, okay, understand. Can we just stay another session just to look into the relationship? Because I was really, I, I was like shocked. If I'm honest, I was shocked. Like, how could that happen to me? What has happened at all? So to, to better understand, like, to make sense of where did I potentially lose her? Hmm. What has happened for her? What, what was she picking up that I was totally obnoxious <laughs> to? So, um, and that was the moment that gave birth eventually to the book. But then first I, I, I made my doctoral researches, my PhD, um then i published everything and then i i was invited to write a book so that's how it came about even wow you know um for, for the longest time ever i i have been familiar with the power of nonverbal nonverbal language right and uh, now i'm a little bit of a you know extremely self-aware and self-conscious about my own nonverbal uh, language so much so and I don't pick up on every single thing that I do. But for example, one thing that I do pick up on is when I cross my arms, when I'm talking to somebody and I cross my arms. And now it became a very conscious action that as soon as my body is crossing the arms, because I am not uh, making that decision myself, I immediately override that and I immediately open my arms again. Um, because what I'm thinking is I don't want to project the 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 idea perhaps for for somebody else to think that I am close minded to what they are saying or they that I am not believing in them or that I am like just trying to hog myself to protect myself from what they are saying whatever it is right but I and that's that's one of them and there are many other such nonverbal unconscious things that we do that I myself because I have become so much so, so aware of this 
now I try to override with conscious decisions. And I think that is so powerful. And I, 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 I'm thinking about the, what you just said, you know, the, uh, you know, Tunda, you're saying yes to this, but you're, 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 you're moving back in your chair. What's going on? I think that's so powerful. Yes. And I'm so happy that you are bringing this up and thank you very much for offering up this example, because it, it reminds me of how I thought that nonverbal language, body language was working. So I thought, oh, yeah, okay. Um, so if I do this or if I do that, you know, if the body's moving in some way, then of course that's gonna have some impact on on the on the person that I'm I'm interacting with. But then what I found in the course of my research was something more profound, which is which goes beyond this 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 you know what we what we what I knew or what was uh, common knowledge back then when I started um, doing my research about body language. Because I thought it was a matter of body language, mm. but then I found it wasn't. Mm. It, it, it wasn't just that. It was something that that went that goes into the field of synchronicity with each other. So wow. it's not about me, but it's about some. It, it's about something that is co-shaped. It is. It cannot happen if I don't have somebody uh, interacting with me. And it's not just the body language because synchronicity and especially movement synchrony. So we are really talking about the body holding some hidden intelligence. So it's not just about do I do this or do I cross my arms <laughs> or do I, I don't know, like do this or it, it's not a specific movement, conscious or unconscious, because we can also use movement to imitate, you know, like in neuro-linguistic programming to kind of like persuade for, for yeah. purpose of persuasion. So this is, this is not the field that we are in. So we are really talking about this something in us, some hidden intelligence is speaking through the body that is, that we, and it's spontaneous, huh? Like, for example, the way that I'm using my hands and arms now, it's not core. It's it's not that I'm consciously coordinating this, so it is expressing something about it's it's trying to transport information to the other person, yeah, to the to the audience here, for example, or to you as well. And I was curious, like, what is it prompted by? Hmm. Well, because we need to understand. If we don't understand what is prompted by, I can consciously change it in a moment. But I haven't become any wiser. Yeah. I don't. I don't understand what what is the mechanics and what are the consequences of what I'm doing. And if I then disclose my arms, then again that will have yet another impact on the other person. So each and every micro movement that we make will have impact. So and I was curious about like what prompts, what stimulates movement. And I came to the field of uh, movement synchrony and which is about energy. So it's, we are holding energy in ourselves. We are, Einstein said already, we are energy. And we are, and the energy that we are carrying in us is gonna be our presence. And that energy is, we cannot change just by uh, shifting a micro movement consciously. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna because we are more uh, holistic. We are more embedded in in a relationship, in a wider context, and we are carrying in us everything that that how the world is impacting us. Mm -hmm. And I would like to come back to the resolution of uh, of this issue with this client that I had because when I found out why there was this incongruence between the words coming forward and the body moving backward. What I found out was that when I was hired to be an executive coach for that female client, I remember the CEO had said, you better make this one work. <laughs> and I took it for granted. Enrique, I took it for granted because of course I do my best. I mean, we, we all want to do our best, but I didn't realize how that actually landed on my body, this pressure, this moment of pressure. And I'm very sensitive to pressure. Mm. And I didn't realize in the moment how that th those words, those exact words, you better make this one happen. 
actually cognitively I wasn't aware of, of the impact it was having, but my body very well picked it up. Wow. And then I was in the session with the client, that pressure was like, that was this, whoa. Yeah. It, it was actually showing the truth about me, how, how tensed I was because I needed to make it happen, better make it yeah. happen. Yeah. yeah. Wow. You know, I, we, we're going to go back to that. I, and I'm, I probably want to save the resolution of the story to the end of our conversation. So don't, don't say it yet. Don't, don't, don't give us a resolution, but, but actually navigate us through the process of discovery. Right. Um, because, and, and again, you know, I am reflecting about my own life and uh, and my own sort of professional interactions with other people and how, how, when there's the energy there, right? I think the body has movement, that synchronicity that you're talking about, which by the way, I love the word synchronicity and synchrony. I think it's, uh, it's a very, very beautiful word. And the meaning that you're describing behind it, even more beautiful than the actual word itself. And that movement, the your entire energy being in alignment with that other person, I think that is so beautiful. But then the opposite, could be true as well. Then when there's no, when there's mismatch, then your body's like, you know, like cringing and, and, you know, tensing up and all that. So how, how do you go about discovering how your body's reacting to people, to conversations, to topics, and how do you become more uh, conscious about perhaps, I don't, I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but overriding some of those unconscious uh, reactions that your body is is uh, engaging in, or I don't know. I don't know what will be the the process, right? To to uh, find a, a resolution when you find yourself in that place. Yeah. Okay. So let's come to the practicality first, because so how 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 does it actually practically work in in an interaction with somebody? Mm. Um, Enrique, the thing is that. I'm so excited about talking about this. I, I don't even know. Sh- sh- should I tell them how I measured this? Because, you know. Please, say, say the good because, stuff. Because don't I, hold back. I, the problem was when I went to university to do my PhD about this, people told me, you're never going to make this. We can't measure this. And I said, want to bet? <laughs> <laughs> and then I found in Switzerland um, a professor at Bern University who has devised a technology which is called motion energy analysis a software that if we videotape people in the room interacting with each other we can very well so the software is can very well measure the energy between two people in terms of synchronicity and what are the implications of those synchronicity so when is it relevant at all when is it relevant and when it's not relevant And that's how I found, before I come to the practicality, please allow me to say just this thing that it's very, very complex. So it's, we cannot break it down to just a simple five steps, like five steps to happiness. (laughs) (laughs) This This is not possible because in my research, which we did over time, so we looked into coach client dyadic processes over eight months. So coaches uh, were invi- uh, invited to uh, video record their sessions and over eight months. So those sessions were all collected, the data. So we had analyzed 5,000 um, um, video material, pieces of video material, which is pretty good for generalizability. And what we found actually is that when people believe that they are present, so you know that they are in sync with somebody, that they are that they are paying attention, that they are interacting. The other party doesn't perceive it as that. Yeah. So it's it's just this moment of how our perceptions are differing in what is real. So sensitize me to the complexity of hey, wait a second. And then in the process of, of our measurements, we also found over time again, yeah. So we really looked over time. It's a massive piece of of research that happened there. And it also has been awarded a Harvard uh, grant scholarship. I I received a scholarship for this. Because we were able to use technology 
to look beyond our you know self-reported ideas of what is going on between two people mm -hmm. which is more reliable when we have objectified data so and we found that when for example our own biases in bias in terms of when we're in love with an idea for instance when we're in love with a model in coaching we are we love models and methods <laughs> and I don't know what. so when a coach is in love with his or her model that's actually taking so much presence away from the realities from the complexity of the realities in terms of what is going on for him what is going on for the client or her what is going on in the relationship dynamically what is how the immediate context is playing out in how they are interacting with each other how the cultural philosophical ideas that each of us holds in us how all that is actually playing out in how we how we are present or not so those when we notice that even even when we are in love with a certain model that will lead to us believing that we are present and actually we end up totally desyncing with the client hmm. it, it got even more and more complex hmm. so you see so it, it's getting yeah. layers i could talk on and on about examples how that it's it's not just about how we are adjusting a piece of hand or a piece of leg <laughs> i'm lifting my leg here or a, a piece of pair of glasses somewhere to to it's that's not about that would be too superficial to understand when we are present with someone and when not you know you know can, can i say something one second about this uh and i know you want to go to the practicality on how to get this done but i want to say one thing i i recently wrote an article about um six principles for hr people to become leaders trailblazers And the first article, the first principle is called be inspired. And this is what it is about. What I'm saying in the principle is that the models of how to do good HR replaced the inspiration of why we do why, what we do. Oh my gosh, it is so connected with what you're saying. Because mm -hmm. we, I believe this, by the way, and some folks in here may disagree with me, but I, this is what I believe and I, and I have observed it, which, which is now... I think we've lost part of what, why we are doing this work, right? We love a little bit. We lost a little bit of our love for, you know, lifting up people and helping them grow because we became so focused on the model, on the, on the, you know, A, B, Z kind of things to do that we lost that inspiration. And it's that what you're saying. And so therefore there was some synchronicity lost between what we're doing and the people that we're serving in our yes. work communities. And you have the science for that. So I was not that wrong about that one principle. <laughs> I mean, you know, I just put it into some scientific knowledge, but yeah. it's, it's nothing that I have invented, I would say, because yeah. it is our wisdom. It mm. is our wisdom, like, how are we, because what are we present to is, is, is the question number one that I'm asking always, like, because we're human beings, we keep forgetting this. Mm. Because when you say, oh, when, when, you, when you listen to coaches speaking, so coaches, oh, I'm present. I just conducted, um, conducted 76 in semi-structured interviews uh, with um, coaches who work uh, mostly online. Because I was curious, like, how would coaches gauge, like, estimate how, how present they are? And something similar happened again. Those coaches said, oh, I'm present. 2D works. Perfect. Virtual work. Perfect. And I said, I incredible it doesn't work for me that well it's yeah. it's different when i'm in co-located spaces and it's totally different when i'm on screen it's a different way of being so what is it that we need to be present to and then i and i realized that we human beings seem to be geared and that's also what gestalt psychology says which is an established field of psychology says we human beings are wired to see reality in a way that is devoid of complexity mm -hmm. unfamiliarity we like the simplicity in things that's how we choose to meaning make so while this is comfortable and soothing the mind so it's really soothing the mind to know okay i have a simple answer to something it actually leads to very wrong decision making mm -hmm. 
because we we are not taking in we are we don't want to because we don't want to deal with complexity because it's more work and it's more effort and it takes it's difficult and the human mind is not wired to be able to do this so the more complex also our world is getting although i believe that the world has always been complex <laughs> Just in a different way, in different eras, in different times for different people. And we are over, we are just over talking about this. We are talking too much about how more complex it's becoming. It's not. It has always been complex, but we just don't want to deal with this complexity. But we would need to, in order to sense, and now I'm coming to the practicalities also, to get a real sense of what is going on, so that then on the basis of that, we can take more well-informed decisions always keeping in mind that we will never be able to be present fully and that's where my research is coming in is breaking the myth for coaches it's very difficult for coaches to to swallow the pill when they are speaking about full being fully in in the here and now and when i'm saying you are not you cannot mm -hmm. You know, selling this idea of being fully present and like, we can't, we're a human being. Yeah. While I'm looking at you, I cannot see the tree in front of me. <laughs> but that tree is actually swinging very nicely. And it's actually, I'm also noticing how I'm sometimes swinging in response <laughs> to that tree here. Wow. <laughs> And I'm not sure if you have noticed, but I, I noticed just that why am I why am I why am I doing this dance? And then I looked a little bit afar and at the tree, just really huge. It's like, oh, I am sinking in with that while I'm talking to you. Like, and this is just two levels of being present. Yes. Yeah. And there's a lot, lot more. And all starts with our seven senses. Because we take in information through the senses. S seven senses? Seven, yeah. Can why? you say what can you say what are the seven senses? Yeah, so five are commonly known. Those five I know, yeah. The other two, I'm not sure that I know. <laughs> so um, the hearing, mm -hmm. the eating, the smelling, the tasting, and the touch. The tech Correct. Type. Correct. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and those, one, those ones I know, yeah. <laughs> Correct. So I didn't make a mistake here. Good. Tick the box. No, but uh, Enrique, the, and then, then there is more. One is called the vestibular, mm. which is about balance, which is giving us a sense of balance. And that's a very simple example. What I mean by this is it's, it's located in the ear, in the inner ear. Yeah. And it's actually, there is a fluid in the inner ear that is yeah. giving a tab on how we are balancing uh, our movement. Yeah. And we can notice that in small babies, because when they start, you know, when they wobbly, when they start walking, then they, they, they are still wobbly because they, they don't find their balance yet. So that's yeah. when they start engaging with this sense. Mm -hmm. And that's called vestibular. So this is about the sense of balance. The seventh one is called proprioception, which is about uh, our how we are perceiving that my right hand is my right hand. And my left hand is my left hand. And how, for example, when I close my eyes, I can put my finger on my nose without seeing where my finger is going. Mm -hmm. So being in relationship, in physical relationship with ourselves, it's about the coordination, the sense of coordination, uh, which is called. And, and that's um, more in the muscles and in the joints. And the vestibular sense is more in the, in the inner ear. But this yeah. is senses and, and the processes in us that take in information from the outside world. And we, and we need to work in a balanced way with all seven senses in order to then start understanding how we perceive the world, then how we feel about the world, then how we think about the world, and then what we do, how we act. And this, mm -hmm. there is this letter of of awareness that uh, I found is relevant when we would like to work on our presence. And why I said that we are never fully present is because we never have all our seven senses all okay 100%. Yeah. We all have references. Some are more audio, some are more visual. You know that. I mean, we, we, we know that we have preferences around. And that's the problem. So while it's okay, 
on one hand. On the other hand, it poses a problem because we are not using our seven senses in a balanced way. We are not even thinking about, uh, am I wobbly now or not? How is my sense of balance right now? We are too much just concerned with either one, maximum two senses that we are tapping to gain information from the outside world. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also we believe that it's the brain who's doing the job of thinking for us. And that's wrong. That's, that, that's very wrong because before the brain can do anything for us, any good job for us, hopefully, information needs to hit the body. Mm. From its external stimuli hitting the body, hitting our seven senses. Then the seven senses kind of like give us signals like, what am I seeing? Ah, I see a round shape or I hear a bad word. Huh? So we, we start giving qualities mm. to what we are seeing and hearing. And that's also a problem because I'm not criticizing anyone, but we are human beings and we just mix up sensing and perceiving. So we are, we are so fast living creatures and, 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 and beings that we are not, like, am I sensing or am I perceiving? Mm. The same holds true for thinking and feeling. When and what is, what, and what, is, what is the difference? Like, how do you define the difference between sensing and perceiving? Sen sensing is pure sensual. So you know that you heard a word mm. and you can reproduce the exact word. That's in what, what, what in coaching is called by eat, listen actively, right? Listen. But only the problem is that research shows that while 85% of what we learn is through hearing, only 25% of that 85% we understand. <laughs> so we don't even understand what we hear, but we so much and so heavily rely on what we are hearing. So, so a hearing or touching, when I touch something, we have unlearned, when I ask people, touch the, touch the desk or touch your own skin. What is this touch? Hmm. They start telling me how they feel. I said, no, no, I didn't ask you what you feel. <laughs> Just tell me what's the touch of this. So they can't even say cold or warm. Yeah. So that's how we are confusing our reality. So we are not present. So that's why we are, it all goes wrong. And, by the, and, by, and when we believe that we think something, very simplistic way, because we are wired to do so, we start taking decisions to act. Hmm. And that's where presence is not just relevant for coaches. But it's for leaders a lot more, actually, than for coaches, I would say. So let, 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 let me say something here uh, based on what you what you have said before. Just just a little bit of um, for me to be able to catch up because this is complex stuff, right? Um, and I want to be able to catch up with where you are. The, being present is using our seven senses. If we are, if we if we have them, right? If we are able to use those seven senses, there are people. I think somebody commented here. Uh, about her experience, his or her experience. Uh, I can't see the name with a with a deaf son and and two deaf grandchildren. Right? So if we can use if we can use and we have the ability to use our senses, it is using those seven senses. But it's also understanding that we will never use those seven senses for the one thing for the one layer of whatever it is that is happening in front of us, because there are a trillion things happening around us, and some of those senses. My eyes can be on you, my sight can be on you, but I can be hearing the car and the siren of the fire truck going on back here in my house, right? So what you're suggesting as presence is using those seven senses in the in the best way or in the most uh, effective way to be fully present. Is that right? Yeah. And also to to be open to these, um, to, to be more open to stimuli. Mm. And while I say something about this, I would like to come back to that comment in the, in the, in the chat box is um, those people who are, who don't, who don't have access the way like other, we normally have, let's put it this way, not normally. And I'm, I, I apologize if my English doesn't suffice to ex explain how I respect uh, every, um, every way of being and each way of being. We, um, it, it's a very nice example because it, um, it shows us how those people who, for example, cannot hear, they compensate through something mm. else. So there is another sense that, that comes to help, comes to, to support. 
so that we can we can function healthily and that's why we sometimes say that those who are deaf are actually they sense even more because they are so much reliant on other on the other senses to make sense of the world because they can can either not see or not see or either not hear so that's that's yet another layer of complexity to this yeah. Yeah? but the other thing is that um and i give you an example because i don't want to theorize too much here i had a, a client um sitting with me in a session and she really did a lot of cognitive thinking and she was working on an issue. It doesn't matter what it was. And then um, suddenly we, we went silent because she we, we reached a stage where she was thinking about which action to take next. And we were sitting there in, in silence and I'm living in the forest here and I've got a neighbor who has got uh, roosters. <laughs> okay? And we were sitting in silence. I was very patient because okay i was sitting there and suddenly one of the roosters it was 12 noon huh, started <laughs> and i started st i started laughing because I'm like, that's so weird and she was and the client was looking at me and said thank you for laughing and i said <laughs> wow. what and she said you know what i've just realized because I also wanted to laugh, she said, but I didn't dare to laugh because I thought it would be stupid to laugh in the coaching session. <laughs> but because you laugh, because I paid attention, I just I just picked it up as open to taking in the stimulus, to work with it. If I had kept it to myself, like I have to be present, this is a, a moment of silence, you know, like if I had, had done it this way, I would have missed an opportunity to be real, huh? to be yeah. present. Sense that is helpful for somebody else to make sense of her own of her own world. So she decided that because that rooster was so crazy to do the kikiriki at noon <laughs> on that special day, she decided she wants to be crazy <laughs> and also to try crazy ways, like like unconventional ways of being. So <laughs> probably the best moment in this coaching was that that rooster. <laughs> And, and how we went silent so that I could hear it and pick yeah. it up. Wow. It's about being present. Uh, and um, Tunda, as we get closer, I, I think we, 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 we will need another session for this because there's so much more that I want to talk to you about. And by, by the way, for everybody tuning in right now, generally what I do when I prepare for these conversations, I prepare a list of questions together with my guests. So. I have a list of questions that I was going to ask uh, Tunda today, and I just turned the page to the blank part of the page, and I didn't ask any of the questions that I was <laughs> supposed to be asking, and I wrote about a whole different set of things, which are related to the conversation we wanted to have, but none of the questions that I wanted to ask, uh, because I just wanted to go in a different direction. I think it's part of what you're, you know, this sensing, right? It is like, there's energy, and we talked about this before, Tunda, you know, there's energy in a different direction. Let's just go in that direction. It's, it's a still a learning experience. It's a still an uplifting uh, experience, at least for me, and I'm hoping for for my for my uh, audience as well. But it just the, the energy was taking us in that direction, and 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 I think it's it's just powerful. And as we get closer to wrapping up this first chat, because I definitely would love to have you back for the second part of this. <laughs> I, I would love to have you back for the, have you back for the second part of this. I definitely want to know the resolution of um of what happened with that client that you said yes but you moved back and she or he perceived something that was not you know the right vibe perhaps for that one person what happened uh, as a resolution to that case thank you enrique for bringing me back to this because i i know that i can hijack people with my <laughs> stories and, I, and I probably i wasn't present enough to you so i i i really want to own it that proud because with my exuberance and my <laughs> just loving my topic and and what i've been doing so far sorry if i hide no you. it's okay <laughs> <laughs> um so the resolution was so when i when i so I, I started looking into this the mechanism of pressure so when we are holding pressure in the body the the body will not lie it will show mm. it will realize the relevance of i can't make it until i fake it so it doesn't make sense to try to just superficially take on 
gestures or try to change something and, and never again lean back. That's not the point of not leaning back. It's about understanding what am I potentially holding in my body mm. as unprocessed information. Something that I have not yet paid attention to, but it's lodged in the body because mm. the body will just take it in as a container. And in moments that are relevant, it will come out in either in a way that is synchronous with the environment, with the people we are interacting with, or in an, a, an asynchronous way or a desynchronous way. So it's either going to be totally <laughs> the opposite or it will just be desynchronous, which is not a bad thing at all. Yeah. So understanding like and, and becoming more aware and more curious, what am I potentially holding in my body in terms of unprocessed information? is the first thing that I have done. And then when we started talking about this issue with the client openly, and she she saw my vulnerability, she said, Tunde, I don't want to leave coaching now, actually. <laughs> so she stayed on so we could move on and then do the journey. So it also sensitized me to the fact how vulnerability, this very fact of, I, I think I used the word obnoxious. <laughs> Being obnoxious to something can also create moments of, of creativity, moments of insight, moments of genuine, authentic exchanges that can take our relationships to, to the next level. So it's not, it's not bad to desync or async with someone. It's just about like, how am I working with it? So if I miss not to be present any given moment, and trust me, we will always miss moments to be present because we're human beings. The point is not to try to become fully present. This pool, I have to, I do, but learn to become more because it always helps. But more like when I'm not present, this, I, I call it presencelessness. Yeah? <laughs> presenceless, yeah, I'm less, I'm less present, I'm presenceless. So how am I, who am I in this moment of presencelessness? How am I choosing to work with this moment of presencelessness? Mm -hmm. uh, that's more for me more important than at least in my own practice and it has it has shown to work very well because the clients are not stupid nobody's yeah. stupid they also feel like sometimes vulnerable and not on top of them themselves and knowing that they are not present but then when they feel that this can happen it's a normal way of functioning it's soothing the mind it's distressing you know it's relaxing yeah. And then we can lean into the real work that needs to be done. Oh, that is fascinating. And thinking about achieving that fully presence in whatever it is, seems to me a little bit of an impossibility, given that we don't live in a bubble, yeah. you know, in a, you know, floating out in a space, right? Where, uh, I mean, not even in a space, I don't know, somewhere where nothing is happening. I mean, there are so many things happening around us, so many noises um, and, and, and sounds and people and, things and thoughts and uh you know that that um i i love that you you know for you it is how can we engage those seven senses if we're able to and we have them uh in ourselves to engage with but at the same time is giving ourselves that moment of vulnerability and saying you know i mean there's a rooster you know uh making a noise out there right so i can make a joke out of it and laugh or there's a siren of a fire truck behind my house, you know, what may be happening to my neighbors, I don't know. So I love that, you know, combination of let's try to be fully present while also we acknowledge that we're humans and or that we're human. And, you know, the world is a, is a busy place and, uh, and, and, you know, things will, will demand some of our, some of our attention in some way from some of our senses. So Tunda, I think we need we definitely need a second part of this conversation because I have so many more questions, uh, but this was amazing. Thank you so much for sharing the, the the insights of the research that you've done about coaching, but also human presence. You know, it's like very, it's way larger than just that coaching presence. And, and I appreciate you being here with me and, and sharing that with the community. And we're going to be planning uh, the second the second chat soon. So everybody as well, Thank you so much for being here. If you have missed any of our previous live chat sessions, go to our website, hackinghr.io, check them out. Awesome conversations like this one in there. And, and I hope to see everybody soon. So thank you so much, Tunda. And thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.
Thanks, everyone. Thank you Thank for you. taking your time to listen to this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>